Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yash, and I am a professor of computer applications um, in Conestoga College. And I'm here uh, to tell you a little bit about how to manage your social media um, footprints um, online and how to turn them into strong footholds. Uh, uh, just about two weeks ago, we had our midterms. Uh, and then it was 15 minutes about before the midterm began. And one of my students decided that they had something very important to ask me about the syllabus of the course um, that, was, that he was being tested on. Now, it was 15 minutes before the exam. He sent me an email. Um, I was setting up my classroom, so I was unable to respond to him. Um, about two or three minutes of the exam, I got a text message. I got a text message of this gentleman saying that, hey, um, he is trying to reach to me. And he has something very important to ask to me. So I just I chose not to respond to a text message. It was just two minutes before the exam began. Um, after the exam, however, I kind of asked him to keep uh, communication only through professional email. And I also asked him, how did he get my phone number? And he's like, well, he was just desperate to get a hold of me before the exam. And uh, he just searched my name. He just searched my name on, uh, on Google. and he found a, uh, like a, like a website that I had built a while ago. And in the contact us page, he found my phone number there. And I was like, oh, that was a website I had built like about five years ago. And it's amazing how it's, it's not even search engine optimized. So it's probably on the fourth or fifth page somewhere on Google, but he could find it. And he could find it and he could get to it. it kind of put me on that, um, on that note, like it got me thinking like, how can people um, find each other? If, if someone wants to get a, get a hold of me, they can they can figure it out. They can they can get my address. They can get my phone number. So there is a lot of me out there that is out of my reach. It is out of my control. Um, how many of us have actually gone to uh, ratemyprofessors.com and try to search yourselves up? If you go on ratemyprofessors.com right now, and if you could actually search your name up. Um, you'd be amazed to see that there is a massive student channel well, where students talk about teachers all the time. Um, it, it, it greatly affects how um, students choose to drop in or drop, like choose or drop out of courses. Um, they get to know who the teacher is, get to know about how the teacher teaches, and yada, yada, yada. Some people also post very funny comments and stuff. But the, the, the part is that um, being in a prestigious public facing job role that we are, uh, like professors, like politicians, yada, 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 people look up to us and people are curious about us. Um, unlike in my childhood, I would, I would freak out if I saw a teacher somewhere in the mall or somewhere outside. Uh, but now I'm just so much like I can imagine how students are just so much more curious um, uh, as to like what they can find, uh, find about you. Um, yeah, I mean, like Gina said, it's actually scary when you Google yourself. You'd you would you would be fun. It, it, it's funny. I, I actually found an image of myself on Google that I posted like five six years ago when Orkut was active, or when MySpace was active. So it's a very lingering footprint that remains um, on uh, uh, online. Um, uh, simply putting stuff like that, digital footprints are traces of what individuals do online. Um, it can be either good or bad, or it can be, it can, th there's a lot of negativity associated with this term. Uh, th there's a lot of scary stuff associated with, it, uh, with this term. Uh, but the point is th that I'm trying to make is that we should protect our digital footprints and try to ensure that they are positive. So there are two things involved. We should not only just protect our digital footprint, uh, but we should also ensure that they are always going to be positive. Um, encouraging people, however, to just completely stay out of social media and just not interact with the internet at all, that can, that can be pretty counterproductive. So that is not the point that I'm trying to make here. My point is not to scare you, or rather just to scare you in a very healthy way so that um, it just forces you to kind of go and manage yourselves out there a little bit better. Well, in this little uh, lunch and learn, we're going to learn about how to manage our interactions online how to secure our social media challenge um, our channels, and not only just that, but how to explore them for our own teaching and professional gains. We'll also learn about how to create a blog as uh, blogging can be used to uh, shape our digital footprints very, uh, very carefully and curated way. Um, 
and also in a very positive way. Um, it is very important for teachers to have not only just strong pedagogical skills, but also very good subject matter expertise. Um, and what can be better than um, than having a blog post or having like um, some 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 social media presence out there where people know that we know what we're talking about. It it helps. It inherently helps students or people believe in our skills, and even our employers believe that uh, we know what we're talking about. Uh, but before we get to that, um, I'd like to introduce myself as well, and uh, um, this and also this lunch and learn series. Uh, this lunch and learn series is being brought to you by the Educational Technology Committee, the ETC, and the ETC. Uh, continues to offer these lunch and learn series throughout the year. So you can always stay tuned at the beginning of every term and you'd know um, about what cities are going to go, I mean, what webinars are going to be hosted next. The next one I can see is uh, probably the next week and it's, um, uh, it seems like a very interesting topic and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to attend myself. If you have got ideas for webinars, uh, please submit a proposal on edtechontario.ca that are accepting proposals for 2019 right now. And you can always uh, facilitate that. They're always looking for great ideas um, um, to share with, the, uh, with our little family of professors. The Advanced Learning Conference is happening um, uh, from 15th to 17th of May, uh, 2019 at uh, La Cite in Ottawa. Uh, registrations and also calls for proposals uh, have already been open since late January. So, uh, you can always just look them up online, or if you have any questions, you can just hit Mark or Gina, and I'm sure they'd be uh, more than happy to help you on that. Oh, thank you. Gina, I just shared a few links online. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate that. Um, so before we get into uh, social media, let's try to understand what is what what social media can actually, what kind of effects it can have on us. Um, so the very first basic rule of thumb is to know that whatever we keep on social media is not for us to have. The moment you generate or create something on a social media channel, you do not own 100% of its intellectual property. Um, it, some portion of it is owned by the channel that owns it, um, be it Facebook, be it Twitter, be it yada, 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 which, whichever ones. Um, these social media interactions can linger around in the internet for decades and decades and decades to come. And no matter how, how private your social media account is, say it, no matter how private your Twitter feed is, it would just take one person to simply screenshot a tweet that you, uh, that you tweeted a while ago and, um, and publish it and use it for or against your game. Um, I remember the, they had local elections last year in Kitchener. And there was a person who was uh, who was writing for a particular uh, writing, and uh, somebody went on his Twitter, and the person had like liked some very interesting stuff back in the day. They used it against him, and um, it yeah, something like this can that that, that always happens. Um, general recent elections we had out uh, put some light on the fact of how much and how fastly social media, how fast the internet has spread across the board and the length and the width and the depth it has into our lives and into our societies, and how little regulation exists on such a large and such a fluid market. Um, it, is, it is scary, but um, it is there. Uh, schools like uh, the one I am referring from is uh, a school in the United Kingdom called Portsmouth Abbey School. They have come up with a very general social media guidelines for their professors and academic staff. Um, just with a with a hope that uh, they can they can manage themselves very well. It is very important that we as professors, first of all, make sure, uh, or as academic staff, um, draw very clear lines as to which part of our social media lives we want to expose online. And just like in a classroom where you're teaching about, say, for instance, about. Um, um, say about psychology and all of a sudden somebody asks you a question about your family you can simply say like hey this is out of topic let's kind of stay on, on our topic um, the same way even with social media you can have people you can you can keep yourself private from people you 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 get to choose who sees you how and where can they see you um, it is also very important, if regardless it is be, be, uh, being your social media channel like a Facebook or a Twitter being public or private, 
it is important that our branding and our voice is consistent all across the platforms. Um, we do not show ourselves to be something on one platform and then completely something else on some other platform um, that can come and bite us in the near or past in the uh, far future. Content usually, this is technically for Twitter, the second point of the news is technically for Twitter because Twitter has a 120 character limit that we should keep our content to be short and sweet and posts should technically not be more than one or two sentences. Um, links can somehow be turned to be shorter. So we can always um, look into that slightly later on uh, in the presentation. Um, remember also to remember that our audience is not just our students and our family and friends. It could be our alumni. If you're teaching first to first year, second, especially if you're teaching first year undergrad, there's a very high chance uh, your audience is your, is your, are, are parents too. And um, local community members could also be a part of that. Um, we should we always try our, uh, try our best to make sure that we exercise caution regarding copyright materials. We do not post anything that is um, that engages into upright political issues or stuff like that. Again, um, the point is not to scare you off social media and have you not post anything online. You're free to voice your opinion out there. We live in a free beats free speech society. However, it is important to make sure to draw lines as to what can go towards my uh, what what is allowed to affect my my professional life and um, what what is not. Um, trying our best to make sure that posts do not contain any obscene or any um, any complicated material. It does not badmouth uh, anybody, especially if it's colleagues or other schools or course materials and yada, yada, yada. And it does not contain um, foul or questionable language of any sorts. It's just, um, it, th these are just general guidelines we follow all across social media platforms or so on and so forth. Um, a very important con uh, conversation to have here is to make sure that uh, we, have to, we have to decide if we wanna keep our Facebooks private from our public lives or we wanna keep them public and be okay with it. Uh, some people is like, I have nothing to hide. I don't really care if they're private, public or private. And for some people it's like, I wanna keep my family and friends away from my professional life. And, um, and people are free to add me on other platforms, but Facebook is just for myself and my family and my friends, uh, which is pretty much what I have started doing now, especially after I got a text message, which was random. Um, but um, I, I, I wanna have a space, a, a, a safe space uh, on social media where I can also uh, uh, exercise free speech and, uh, and, and, and talk about how I feel without, the, uh, without having any negative connotations to it. And hence, I, put, I have uh, like privatized my Facebook, but uh, people can have all sorts of opinions. Do not forget to check with your school's policies as well. A lot of schools, uh, like any other public institutions right now, have uh, policies as to what professors can post and yada, yada, yada. Uh, easy way of managing Facebook uh, to, to hide your entire profile or not is to simply go on Facebook. I'm gonna quickly check mine. I don't, I don't mind sharing mine with anybody here. You can simply drop down here, click on settings, and in your settings, you can click on privacy. And there you go. You can quickly manage your, uh, your, your, your privacy here. You can, you can use activity log to see who has reviewed your and who is trying to add stuff onto your walls. You, you can simply change this edit button here, and it's gonna tell you, um, if your, if your future posts are public, they can only be seen by friends. They can be seen by certain friends and so on and by specific friends. They can only be seen by you and yada, yada, yada. It's a very good way to control your entire profile as well. When you post something online, your post can also have your, it can go on your newsfeed. It can go to your friends or whatever. You can always share private post posts as well. It's a good way for, um, to control what goes into our social media. <clears throat> How can you stop people from posting something on a timeline? Someone might argue, well, I am, um, well, I am a very mature person and I try to make sure that my posts are great, but I, am, I go to this, yeah, yeah, this community center, this church, this family member, this gathering, this meetup group, and I've made a few friends and they have certain opinions. They share these opinions and they might tag me on. Um, usually when you see those tagged posts, you will see that big image on your wall. And there's a very little heading on top. It says tagged by 
blah blah person so it's not very evident that something has been tagged so if someone's very quick in opinionating they might just look at your post they, and they might they might open in about you very fast how do you avoid people from posting stuff your timeline you can simply go to the same facebook settings in your left side column click on timeline and tagging and then you can look for who can post on your timeline and you can change that to only me that makes sure that anybody who posts on your uh, anybody tags you online you can always find ways of removing those tags if you don't want to be associated with it or you can simply approve if it if it if it should go on your time uh, on your on your facebook wall or not um, it's always nice to keep it to only me it's the best way of making sure that what you post is uh, it, to making sure that you have 100% control on um, uh, on the kind of impression you give to the general general crowd um, and if people have interesting material to post irregardless of what the setting is here or if, even if it's only me on your activity log it will ask you to review those posts and then you can approve if they go on the timeline as well which is which is something i love about this feature um there is a way in facebook uh, that they had recently come up with this i guess it is recent uh, you can simply go and select a privacy checkup now privacy checkup is a facebook written little script that's going to quickly crawl through your entire facebook profile and it's going to give you a comprehensive report on what um, is what people can see in the outside world and what they can't so um, with privacy checkup i personally haven't taken one in a while but um, facebook privacy checkup seems like a very cool way of getting a little bit of a report of what people can see online and what they can't you can also um, use timeline review to see what posts you're tagged in before they appear on a facebook post so like in my previous slide i was talking about you can enable timeline review in the tagging and you can enable it so before anything, before people tag you onto a certain post uh, and just assume you're going to be a part of their uh, narrative, their rhetoric, their idea, their joke, meme, whatever, uh, you can always approve it um, at your own convenience. And only then uh, you, the tag is going to be displayed uh, out there. Also, there is a setting that is that I have not mentioned in the slide, however, uh, is a good way you can always report a particular uh, post. If there's something that you don't like or you think is, is just straight up inappropriate, you can report it. And um, in the past couple of years, uh, ever since Facebook has been given some heat by the, by the Senate down south, they are taking their reviews and reports very seriously. And now if you report something, there's a very high chance they're going to look at it and even reply to it with either the fact that they removed it or the fact that they don't find anything offensive um, one more important this is what people see online about us but how about people who can search you um, how, how how do i see what others can search me on facebook so you can select what kind of audience can search you online if you don't want people to search you online um, th this should actually be the first slide because this is the very first thing we do uh, in managing our privacy is to make sure who can search us. Uh, should people be allowed to search us? Um, should people just go on their Facebook search bar and type our names and find us um, or not? You can even go to the about section on your profile and you can edit that above section and you can hide stuff there as well. Um, People can look you up using an email address or a phone number that you pass. So if people have a phone number, uh, I mean, if people have your phone number, they can simply just type that phone number in Facebook in the search bar and they will find you. So that is a very scary setting, uh, but people can actually, uh, people can look you up that way. I can give you a quick little demo. I, for the demo purpose, I have, I have uh, hidden that, uh, that, that part here, but now here I can simply type, um, And there you go. I can be found here. So, so it is a very common way for people to simply find stuff. You can even type your phone number here and people will be able to get you that way too. Um, it, is, it is always nice to hide that. So you can always avoid uh, uh, people like 
creeping too far on your profile and stuff. Um, again, I'm repeating this information again, just with the hope that it sticks very well. Um, information you share online or Facebook or anywhere else, this is coming from the Facebook's website itself, the Facebook's privacy setting website, has ability to be copied, pasted, and redistributed with or without your control. Um, it could be used in future job searches, in future, um, in, 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 in any possible way. So always be, uh, be mindful of what you post online. The moment you click the post button, be it an image or a, or a post or whatever, that you will not have a lot of control over it once it is gone. Um, Well, this was all about how to, um, this was the scary stuff on how to start hiding and how to use privacy and yada, yada, yada on Facebook. Um, let us try and see how we can use Facebook for education purposes. People are like, well, I think uh, someone might, might, might think that, oh, I'm taking Facebook like it's some kind of a fort or something and it has to be protected from being forked or something. Um, people can always use Facebook for a lot of education purposes, um, like creating a close group. Um, you can always create a closed group of your school uh, if you don't mind uh, uh, allowing people on your professional network or something on your, on your social network. Um, you can always create a Facebook group and you can close that group uh, where people can be invited only by participation. Uh, I personally love opening up a back channel uh, for communication in my classroom while I am teaching as well. Um, the, it's a, in an adult learning institution, they, you, you do not have to, you just have to worry about creating a, profit, a, a, a community and uh, uh, people can police themselves. So even if you create a back channel with a, with a uh, there is a risk that people might get distracted on the back channel, uh, but the chances of people using it uh, to talk something important are just equally high. Uh, and it has always happened if there's one or two uh, students in my class who are distracted on the back channel and they are passing jokes, yada, yada, yada. There's always a somebody, some other sincere student in the class who's going to ask them to uh, kind of tone it down a little bit. So barely uh, has it ever been that I had to step into the back channel and ask people to uh, stop distracting the class. Uh, this is one of the perks of actually teaching in an adult learning institution, uh, like one of ours. So uh, creating a, a, a private group for sharing notifications and stuff and for sharing additional learning materials and stuff is, is, is a very great, great way of, um, uh, of inculcating uh, social media into, into learning systems. Um, everybody has Facebook. I have barely seen anybody who does, do, who does not have Facebook. But then again, I would always abstain from sharing information or something that has a very high mark value um, or something with a very strong learning outcome attached to it from social media because uh, there's always going to be somebody who um, who has deactivated their profile for whatever reasons and they should not feel peer pressure to kind of join this facebook group of yours um, another good outlook is rather than you creating this facebook page you can always have a couple students in your class to like hey why don't you guys go and create a, a closed facebook group for yourselves and talk amongst yourselves about it um, it you can use facebook for for, uh, for creating closed groups um, you can even create an open group. I, I have another, uh, I know some, uh, somebody in my school who has actually created an open Facebook group. Um, and it's just, a, it's just like an IT at Conestoga kind of open Facebook group where people, be it Conestoga students or not, it's mostly just Conestoga students who, who, who add themselves into the group. And they talk about uh, some advancements they have made, some cool articles they think that people should know. Uh, there are new technologies that are coming out of the market. There's some jobs people are hiring, people are looking for, they can post out out there. I even saw uh, someone hosting like a, like a summer job um, on the open channel where more than, um, more than seven, 8,000 people are gonna read it. So open groups are also, they also have value in them, uh, but then they just cannot be very uh, course specific um, uh, or very domain specific. Um, and we should also be mindful that if it's an open group, people from outside the school are going to join in. So very school specific information should generally be avoided from adding like that. Facebook has a good way of creating polls. Um, you can always have a little classroom poll uh, 
Facebook offers classroom polls. I use Kahoot, but uh, people can always uh, use Facebook as well for implementing um, classroom polls and getting some very general polls on how the class is going and stuff like that. You can have a little exit questionnaire on Facebook as well if, if, if people are on a, on a closed group in Facebook. Exit questionnaires is like uh, the moment you teach your, uh, your learning outcomes for that particular class, you can simply publish exit questionnaires on the, on the closed Facebook group of your class where people can, uh, where your students can go and simply answer a few questions. It's a little quick, ungraded learning assessment that gives you and, and also the students a quick hint into how much they actually got out of the class. So exit uh, questionnaire is a very, is a very powerful uh, learning strategy that has, that, that has gone through some research also um, in Canada and in Europe. Um, course content students can share uh, on these closed Facebook groups. I always make sure that I am added if these groups exist. I mean, if students have created a group amongst themselves, you would never know about it. But um, if, it's a, if it's a group that you have facilitated uh, having some students do it, you can always add yourself to that group just to make sure people are not um, doing anything inappropriate, like sharing more material that they should and problems like that. Um, if people want to stay away from Facebook and not include, like, it's also like, just like we have a choice if we want to publish our Facebook or not, people have a choice too. And students should be free to say like, hey, we want to keep our Facebook away from, uh, from the college premises and we, we are not very uh, comfortable doing that, uh, which is great. People should be allowed to do that. Um, and hence, Facebook has this cool feature called RSS feed. Every time you make posts into a group, people can subscribe to the RSS feed of that particular group. And hence, without logging to Facebook, people can still keep getting notifications of a particular group even before you have, even before uh, anybody has to log in or anybody has to kind of share anything personal. Um, it is a one-way communication channel, but it works great. RSS feeds are very famous. I uh, subscribe myself to a couple podcasts uh, for learning management and stuff, and they are actually very informative. So I, I, I would encourage all of you all to even do something in that. Um, if you guys like to deploy a lot of group work, a lot of think, pair, and share me uh, methodology into your classrooms and stuff, uh, Facebook closed groups can be actually very useful. Uh, if somebody's looking for a pair to kind of pair with and they have nobody to pair in the classroom, if they're they from another program or for another year and they were out for a little bit and they're suddenly into your course and they don't know, it happens more than often when there's somebody in your classroom and uh, they just have not got a chance to make any friends in the classroom yet. And all of a sudden in your week three or week four, if you have some group work, they don't know who to group with. Um, students usually just sit next to each other and they kind of like group with who they have unless you have a way of uh, forming them in groups, Facebook allows you to randomly select people in a classroom group that can, so you can simply have a little randomizer on people in the classroom and they can form, and Facebook is gonna help you randomly select groups. If you allow people to add themselves into groups, Facebook closed groups can be a good way for people to introduce themselves and like, hey, I'm looking for a particular group. Um, I, 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 I want someone to work on, say, particular assignment with or like hey I have an extra pair of textbooks or like does anybody have a textbook for for this particular course I'm looking for something um, a little immaterial um, yet considerable classified ads can also go on Facebook grade groups so there is a lot of value in hiring Facebook from people but there is also a lot of value in allowing Facebook to be included into your learning management as well um, personally I like slack Slack is an alternative to a Facebook closed group. Uh, like I suggested, I, 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 I personally, or some of my colleagues also I know have hidden their Facebook from their, from their professional worlds, but they have, a lot, but they still want to use all the features of a, of a closed Facebook group without having uh, people leverage so Facebook for Facebook for itself. I personally use Slack. Please visit it after this webinar. Slack is a, is a free, um, and a very, a very sleek little tool that allows people to form such closed groups. They only strictly work by invitation only. So um, uh, Slack, is, Slack is great. 
Um, you can you can do whatever work you want. It can have conversations. You can share code if you're into IT. You can share PDFs. You can share files. And um, it's it, it, they have cell phone apps as well. It gives you a little uh, little sweet little notification on your phone if somebody posts something. And you can have multiple channels in your Slack. So you can also have like a channel for like a general channel where people can keep all the distractions and their jokes on the other channel. And you can always have another channel for like the serious uh, course related conversations. Um, usually what happens if you just have one channel like a, in like in a Facebook closed group, if there are 50 messages that are distractions, people are going to simply just mute notifications and they're going to miss out some very important points that you have passed. And hence, uh, the good thing about Slack is that there are couple cha every single group can have channels. So if you have a general or a random channel where people are free to post anything they want, they can still have fun, while you can have a work channel where people can actually work together too. Um, and hence, they can mute the general channel if they want, if they don't want to be included in any of the drama or any of the, any of the fun and the meme sharing and yada, 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 and just stick to the course form. So yeah, please go ahead and uh, uh, use Slack at your, at your convenience. It's a very great tool. Well, that was too much about Facebook. Let's look at some other uh, uh, social media platforms as well. Um, Twitter is, uh, is also a very great way of, uh, is a very great social media net channel out there. I like Twitter myself too, uh, but Twitter, you should, there should be some, um, they sh we should probably have some guidelines to follow when we are posting on Twitter. Um, Twitter allows you to have only 120 character limit. So if there is something in the school that you want to sh share on your Twitter, if you want to retweet something or just want to like share that, which is, um, it is a great thing to do. Uh, my school is currently hosting, like in the success week, they're hosting like a, like a little IT tech challenge. And the link I had to share on Twitter, the link was too big. The link itself hogged all the 120 character limits, I'm like, like most of 120 character limits. And it, not, it did not give me enough chance to, uh, to, to talk about it. So I use something called owl.ly owl to shorten my links to something very small. Um, it's a great little tool you can use to, to shorten your links. Hootsuite has made owl -y and it, it, no matter how big your link is, it's going to simply shrink that link to five or seven characters. And when people click on that link, they're going to go to the very same page that you want them to go to. So Owly has been created by, by Hootsuite, and I personally use Hootsuite uh, Hootsuite to kind of shrink whatever I post on my Twitter. Um, retweeting is a very great way. Um, always follow your school. Always follow the, the provincial, uh, your provincial, I mean, well, I guess we're all from Ontario, so the Ontario Provincial Education Ministry as well for important information and stuff. They always keep posting news and stuff online as well. Um, uh, there is a way of th there's a way to add to kind of tag stuff in Twitter. It's called hashtagging. So it is always nice to know whatever is your schools or whatever is your entire college's um, hashtag, like school of IT, hashtag Conestoga or whatever it is. It's nice to know school specific and college specific has hashtags as well. So you can always hash things and um, create some um, create some noise where it has to be created. Simple rules like anything that can be converted to an abbreviation, go for it. As far as those abbreviations are not too technical or complicated, always replace an A and D and with an ampersand. Um, it gives you, uh, it's a great way of conserving characters on Twitter as well. Um, another thing is to do, is to not um, follow for a follow. If somebody gives you a follow, that's probably, it's probably a student or an academic staff or whoever, you do not have to feel the pressure to follow them back again. I feel people unduly feel uh, tremendous pressure, like, oh, somebody has followed me, I have to follow them back again. There is no such written rule or unwritten rule that I am aware of that forces you to follow uh, somebody just because they followed you. And it is, not, it is not offensive at all if you choose not to follow somebody. Um, it's always nice to follow your school, though. Um, how do you protect your Twitter's feed? Um, Twitter has a very quick little way of doing that. It is very similar to Facebook. You can simply quick click on your Twitter account and you can drop your little face, your profile down here. You can click on your settings and privacy, and that's where you can see your Twitter name and your email address associated with it and stuff like that. And you can click on Twitter privacy. You can protect your tweets. 
and you can always tweet from a location. Now, these are very two good ways of protecting how, how tweets take place. Tweet with the location says that it's going to, you can tweet with locations such as your city or, or, or something like that, or from a third party application as well. So if, if the tweet is not, if you have kind of used Twitter to log into like a third party application, and uh, that third party application, like log in with Twitter, is now making posts on your behalf. People can see that the post has been made from whatever channel on the behalf of Yosh. So that is a good way of telling people like, hey, this is not what I have, I have created. It is something that, um, that, uh, that is coming from a particular, a particular location. And when I protect my tweets, uh, tweets uh, these tweets are not, when I protect my tweets, tweets are not always going to be public. They can only be shared among certain people. Uh, you, can, you can choose who tags you in pictures, and you can also choose who can discover you. Can you, do you want to let people to be, uh, to find you by email address or by phone number? If you deselect these, they will not be able to find you by a phone number or an email address. They will have to use your Twitter handle only in order to find them. Um, you can, you can, if, if you have too many notifications, you can do these. If you block somebody on Twitter, um, they will never be able to see your posts. If you block somebody on Twitter, they will never be able to see your posts. However, if somebody they have followed and they are now retweeting your information, people will be able to see. So nothing is always 100% private in Twitter. So it's, it's always a good thing to know at the back of your mind. No matter what you tweet, somebody is going to see it somewhere. Um, tweets can be complicated if, it is a sensitive, if it's sensitive information, inappropriate material, dark material. You can always go and report a tweet and they will come back to you um, as soon as they can. You can, you can see, we also saw how people can be discovered through Twitter and how to stop yourself from being discovered by using certain methods. Uh, you can block Twitter accounts as well. Block people, again, cannot see your information. They can, however, indirectly get uh, information that you post. Um, again, that was about Twitter. Um, LinkedIn is a good place to keep public, even in a school platform. Um, LinkedIn has a lot of good, uh, good implications to it. I personally like keeping LinkedIn public and people can find me with my email address. I've also associated my college's email to my Twitter, uh, to my LinkedIn account. So people can actually use my college email to find me on LinkedIn. The, the students, academic staff members, chairs of other schools and including your own school, uh, deans, uh, Twitter, uh, I mean, LinkedIn is a very great place for people to see your, um, uh, see your, see the professional side of you. Students who have now passed out, alumni who are now working in the industry and stuff, they're always looking for references. They're always looking for connections to be made once they're out of school. If they're finding you on LinkedIn, uh, they, they, they like you. Uh, there's a very high chance they like you. If, if somebody does not like a teacher, they're going to take off right, right as soon as possible and not spend time finding them online. So LinkedIn is a very great place to be found uh, online. I personally like to keep it public, and I would also encourage you guys to do so. LinkedIn, the good part about LinkedIn is that it always remains professional. So if certain conversations are private slash personal slash inappropriate, you can happily block them, or you can just choose not to respond to them, and that would be great because, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, th there is no such social uh, personal pressure like there is on social media that forces you to kind of like, hey, now he's 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 having it, he's having an in on my quote unquote personal life or whatever it is. It's a very professional social media platform. Um, we will look shortly how um, how um, social media can how LinkedIn can actually have a certain very good implications on your uh, on your professional teaching life and and some bad ones, but for the most part they're just good. General guidelines for LinkedIn is to make sure that you have a very professional headshot. Um, a very good thing to do for LinkedIn is to kind of like have yourself a picture in your classroom, uh, maybe even while you're teaching. Um, carefully still making sure that no other faces are covered while doing so. Uh, LinkedIn headshot is a, is a great way to give people a quick insight into what you're doing. LinkedIn also allows you to add a, a background image behind behind you. That could probably be um, 
your school title or something based on uh, what the what policy the school follows. A very descriptive headline would tell people also potential um, like uh, other potential chairs in schools and your school and your prospective slash alumni students slash current students about who you are. Um, a good descriptive headline um, uses words like nurturing, like nurturing the whole uh, the whole child for for a, for a third grader teacher, rather than something saying something like helping children learn. I'm just a sports teacher, or I'm like a seventh grader teacher, or I'm or like I'm like a college professor. Like it would be nice to say like uh, I'm a I, I'm a computer science faculty teaching yada yada yada, and I have. Uh, like I can nurture students, I can help students, whatever it is. A good descriptive headline will make sure that people catch a key. People have uh, people, people, as people stay on to your uh, LinkedIn and give it a good read. I lost my mouse click here. Sorry, one second. Oops. There you go. Some other guidelines for LinkedIn I would like to add is to add a summary that highlights your experience. Um, if you're into IT, you can add technical experience. If you're into, say, for instance, into teaching communications courses, you can always say have some experience. Say, for, like, say for instance, you have experience teaching in uh, teaching communications. You've worked in these many industries. You have um, like whatever experience you have, whatever extra certifications you have. You probably taught as a second or a third language. English is a second language. Or French is a second language. You can always add that. Um, your career development goals go along with your descriptive headline it gives people like especially if you add like past two of your positions especially if they are somewhere related to your work environment either teaching or uh, uh, or on field work enormously it brings so much of faith into people that you can do your job it, it is just high school science this is how people in high school get popular quote unquote if 15 people like this person, I must like him too because there is something about him. People subconsciously, that's how it works. Um, if these many employers have liked uh, my teacher, I must like my teacher too. There is something about my teacher. There's something that he teaches me or the chair might think like, oh, or the dean might think like, oh, he has worked in these many schools. These many schools have liked him. I must like him too. There's something about the skills that I must want or I must associate myself with. So it's always, always nice to brag about your previous positions um, and have strong career development goals as to what you are doing right now and what do you see yourself doing in the uh, near and far future. Um, it is all, it, 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 we should not feel too ashamed to ask for references and recommendations, even if it is, for, even if it is from, uh, from alumni students as well. People always come and ask like, hey, can I, uh, like if you have like a coworker or something you've worked with, like a colleague or something, hey, would you like to write me a little recommendation and, and I could write you one too. Uh, students are like, can you write me some recommendation? You're like, hey, thank you for, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to my class. Do you mind recommending me or like, like endorsing some of my skills if you thought I can teach certain things? Um, which, is, which is great to do that as, as, um, as, um, Professors and teachers in, or even as academic staff in um, uh, in colleges, I like to keep, or I have seen people keeping their education section very short and sweet. The education section in Twitter, uh, in LinkedIn, I'm sorry, has been provided for is is more important for people um, who are recently out of school. Um, so unless they've actually gone to like a um, unless you have like a like an amazing uh, educational degree, or if you have some research behind your back uh, that very closely aligns to what you're teaching right now, um, I, I technically try to keep my education section uh, pretty short and sweet, and um, only defines as to where I went and uh, and stuff like that. And I keep information like how like what year or what uh, what my what my CGPA was kind of like hidden from LinkedIn. Bonus tips you can put on LinkedIn to make sure that you can be searched um, is to include an action shot of yourself delivering a lesson. I told you that uh, you can also have if your career has been teaching, say, urban planning or communities and stuff like that. Um, you, 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 you speak about your experience as well and not just speak about where you work. So I worked for yada, yada, yada. But this is the experience I had teaching that. Um, another bonus tip could be. 
um, you think of your your summary portion on your LinkedIn is the place to share it an elevator pitch. Like what sets you apart as a teacher or as an academic staff? This is the best place to go and share information about yourself. Um, if you have any past performance reviews from your school or from your previous jobs, don't. I mean, feel free to mention that as well. You you do not have to mention the document. Just mentioning a few points as to like that. People love to see numbers. If you can mention like I got. Uh, like 95% uh, of, of positive reviews on this particular course I taught or something like that. I mean, uh, which it is a good LinkedIn uh, is, is a bla best place to share all these things. Uh, LinkedIn always has uh, status updates, but LinkedIn status updates are not social, are not like Facebook or even Twitter social updates. Uh, LinkedIn st status updates are mostly uh, should mostly be kept to very professional things like certain courses that you're teaching, certain certain uh, certain time schedule changes and stuff like that. If you have, rather than uh, I mean, you can always share and promote your extracurricular activities. If someone's a great pianist, someone's a great swimmer, someone likes bodybuilding, it can be great to share here too. Um, unlike like I mentioned, unlike middle school. People are interested into uh, uh, and, uh, into professors in colleges and universities. They want to know that you guys are that we are real people, and we also have our dreams, and we also have our own little uh, lives outside the school. Um, probably, if you had a stressful day, or if you're not liking something, um, be it a policy or be it something, uh, LinkedIn is not the best place to post those things. I'm going to quietly I'm, I'm going to scheme through a little bit faster this place because I want to come to something more important, which is search engine optimization. Now, every time we write something online, 95% of the time, this is how people are going to search you. People are going to go John Smith Conestoga enter. They're going to go on Google or they're going to go on Bing. That's what they're going to type. Very few people will know exactly where to find you. Very few people will open five different channels and go each one of them to find you. That takes about 20 minutes of time and people barely have 10 seconds for this. So they're simply going to go to rate my professors or they're going to simply go to like a Google and type these three keywords and that's about it. So search engine optimization uh, defines how people find you. The very first page on Google or on Bing or on Yahoo is um, the information that you see has been formed by certain Google developed scripts. They're called as crawlers or spiders that crawl across the internet and they're going to look for someone called John Smith in uh, say Conestoga. So while finding that it is important how search engine optimization works. Whenever you write anything on social media, these crawlers are smart enough to read that text and they can now read that text and they can associate with your name and the very first page will show who you are. When you go back uh, into, your, uh, into your staff rooms or into your own little personal spaces, do not forget to Google your name and see where the very first page you can see about it. And uh, you'd be amazed. Maybe there's something that you really like, that you, that you didn't know, but which is great that, they, that, the, that, the, that the internet is talking about. That's great. Maybe there is something you probably want to hide. This is the best time to do that. You can find from where it's coming from and see how you can hide that information. When you write online, you're not just writing for people. Um, we are writing for people. We've always talked how people, how information should be hidden from people, how information should be secured or managed from people, how information should be demonstrated or should given to people. But social media, you're not just writing for people. You're writing for enormous number of scripts and robots and spiders and these little, little bots and minions that are scrolling across the internet to find information about you and to make sure that the most valuable content that is given to the users. Sounds like a little bit of a science fiction, but it's, it's actually not that complicated. Um, every time you type something, um, these keywords, quote unquote, are picked up by, uh, by Google. And these keywords are picked up by like uh, by search engines like like um, like like Bing or like Yahoo and stuff like that, and hence it just puts so much more importance on having your LinkedIn public and using those right words when you're talking about uh, about yourself on LinkedIn, uh, using words like uh, like 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 adapt knowledge in adapt knowledge in something or like nurturing students like helping people assisting yada 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 like these keywords can be caught by google and that is the very first thing people are going to see across you 
and um, it is it is important to have that um, you can scan and categorize content on linkedin and there is a privacy setting uh, and we're not going to get too much deeper into that but you can get into those privacy settings on google uh, on sorry on linkedin and that allows bots to read information from your social media platform this is a great way of managing and positively reinforcing whatever people uh, impression whatever impression people have of you on um, online Keywords are, are, are everything for search engine optimizations. I'm going to let you uh, give these keywords a little bit of a, a little bit of a read and I'm also going to share this presentation out there so you can always take a few of these words and you can implement these words into your into your LinkedIn or even into your blogs. We learned very quickly in five minutes how to create yourself a little blog. We talked about how blogs are also important in uh, in shaping. Uh, in demonstrating your subject matter expertise in shaping a positive online impression you have out there. Prospective, whether prospective or current or alumni students, whether community members, other schools, chairs, deans, people always look up for people. And a blog is a very nice way of uh, demonstrating um, who you actually are. Some qualities and skills are again some more keywords around here. I'm going to quickly scheme through, uh, uh, keeping, uh, keeping an eye on the clock. I'm going to quickly scheme through how blogging really works, and we can use the last 10 minutes figuring out how to create a blog. Um, I found a channel called Medium for creating a blog. Um, a good place to start is, uh, is a Medium. Uh, Medium is a social media platform where people can actually write blog posts, and it does not take you more than five minutes to actually create a Medium blog post. So uh, let's let's look into how to create a medium blog post. You can always give it a shot, even if you don't like it. It's just one button, and you can deactivate your profile, and you can see how how blog posts can be created. Go to medium.com/me/publications, uh, and the moment you click on new publication, is that where you can actually start creating a very simple blog of your own. Um, this is how a medium typically looks like. The very first portion is. Um, you, you can go and you can give a nice little heading for yourself, which is probably going to be your name, an image if you like to want, if you want to put it. If not, that's fine too. You can always put a blank little image. Um, some description about, about your experience, about what you're teaching and stuff like that. And then you can simply look at the amount of stories that you have. Now, number two is that where, where, where your publication name is going to go. That is going to be your handle where people can find your blog post. And then you can always connect your 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 professional or personal email, and you can also connect your little Twitter account if if you want to allow people um, a little bit deeper into your personal life. You can always tag the publications as well. If your school is making publications, you can always tag it uh, tag as uh, tag as well. Um, number three, and we talked about number three and four. Number five is you can put a publication logo. Uh, if you have a logo, or if you want to, if you want to add a logo for your publications, you can always add that, so people can actually see that logo. It's just a way of creating a brand image around uh, your name and your blog post as well. And uh, the last part, number six, is where you kind of post your stories. A story is pretty much a one blog post. You can choose here how your blog are uh, shown to people. So if you want them to be shown as a stream, they can see that way. If you want them to show as styles, your blogs will be shown as styles, and the heading will show underneath it, where people can actually go and click on a particular blog post here and read a little bit about whatever you have put together. Um, blog titles are not like textbooks. So rather than saying something like, um, let's learn, learn how to write a blog, uh, in, a, in a book, uh, chapter names can be like these because they make more sense. By, 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 by the time somebody's reading, say, chapter five, learn to write a blog, people have already purchased the book and the book is gone. They don't have to sell the book anymore. But when you're writing a blog post, you have to sell that blog post. So rather than saying something like, um, learn how to write a blog, you can say something like, five amazing ways of writing a blog. Something like, your dentist has been lying to you all your life. Or you can even get dramatic. Guess what made Meghan Markle cry during her wedding day? Stuff like that will catch attention and people will want to read a little bit more. And that is how you attract more traffic. That's how people know uh, a lot about you. 
sounds like a little bit of a business, but it's just simply a way of selling yourself. Um, this is another, uh, this is some uh, uh, online gentleman called Gabriel, whose who, who's, um, who's, uh, medium profile is this. Um, Gabriel has kindly given me permission to kind of use his little image uh, here. You can see how he has stories going on three different languages in a, in a couple of different languages, I guess. And then how his blog posts have been put together. You can see the names of his blog posts, how they are. They sound like blog posts. He has connected his stuff here. He has tagged his publications. Every time people search for say, Brazil or marketing, uh, they will be able to come to his blog post. And he has some little publication logo that probably he created um, using like a paint brush or something. Um, you can also go and purchase your own domain. It doesn't have to be medium.com slash, uh, slash John Smith. It can always be, you can go to GoDaddy, you can buy a domain like a .ca domain for something like 15, like say 99 cents or even cheaper. Uh, if you buy it during Christmas, you can get it for 30 cents too. So rather than having like a medium.com slash yosh, you can always have a yosh.ca. I, I don't have that, and this is an example. Or you, you can always have like johnsmith.com or johnsmith.ca, and you can connect that to your medium. So anytime people type, uh, people type say, yosh, like John Smith Conestoga, they'll be able to come to your, to your medium very first, because now there's a domain name connected to your name, and there's a lot of text that is available for crawlers. It is like a feast for, your, for uh, internet spiders and crawlers and bots and minions. They're gonna love coming to your page. This is what will be shown in the very first page, if not the very first thing they see when people Google you. And uh, this is how you can maintain a very strong, positive impression of yourself into, uh, into a digital world with very little or no effort at all. Um, and it has it would have great implications every time that a course gets over I all I have one or two people add me on LinkedIn because people want to be in touch people like each other people want people want recommendations and um, and and why not people should be allowed to uh, be in touch with each other using stuff like that um, you can always I we talked about how to create tags and how these tags work um, well, that was that was all I had. I hope now it is time for us to go and create a very strong digital foothold um, and not have random footprints everywhere uh, on the social media platforms. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop me an email. Uh, I, I, I'm going to drop my email right onto the, into the chat channel. If you have any questions, I would love to address that. I'm sorry for not having an about me slide on. Um, on the presentation. Thank you very much uh, to Mark and Gina and to the ETC uh, committee for allowing me to uh, present to you guys. I look forward to hearing from all of us. And I'm, all, I'm, I'm gonna be active for another 15 minutes. If you have questions, please feel free to drop them for me. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, have yourself a very nice afternoon. It has already started snowing in Kitchener. I hope you guys stay warm. And uh, that is about it.